I've read that uh, you were born in uh, Illinois, Missouri, just across from the Thebes River Bridge in a boxcar. Yeah. Uh, tell me about your, your beginning. They, they were pretty humble. Your family was, was kind of kind of poor. Yeah. In, in fact, uh, I just found out recently that Elmo is exactly 100 miles from Mount Vernon. And as a crow flies, we could get into southern Illinois in about Edwardsville, I call southern Illinois, in about, uh, about two hours, two and a half hours. But my grandfather came up from Oklahoma and worked on the railroad. And he was a straw boss on the railroad. So what he did, as he worked on the bedding for the railroad, they also got accommodations of boxcar to live in. So there's a family of, I think it was 14 of us, that shared the, the boxcar. And more recently, my father was telling me that they put two boxcars together end to end, and that accommodated you know, the families. And during the war years, of course, the, the older kids' sons went off to the military. And so my grandfather and grandmother kind of raised us as their surrogate children back in those days. What kind of values did they give you back then to, to uh, set you on the right path? You know, I get asked that a lot because I, as a corporate board member, I talk a lot about values and ethics and that kind of stuff. And you don't read that stuff and acquire it. It's kind of in you. You either have it or you don't have it. I think we talked about keeping life simple. And, and you know from being in that part of the world, people think pretty simply in southern Illinois and southern Missouri and these places. pretty simple. And we keep things simple. And I think the one value we talked about was... Uh, uh, we look at things for the longer, longer term. Relationships are for long term. Because you couldn't make it alone. Uh, the neighbor had to help. The person down the street farming had to help. So having this kind of attitude about working with, with other people and keeping things simple seems to be a constant in our, uh, our family. It wasn't too long before uh, your family moved to Edwardsville and that's where you spent a lot of your, 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 your younger life? I did, I did. I, uh, I like to recount that uh, the book Tipping Point, they talk about the big breaks in your life. My big break came when that area flooded, and it was flooded every season because it was near the river. And uh, my grandfather from Edwardsville came down and said, that's it. There's no schools around here I can count on. Load up everybody, all 14, 12, 14 of us, and got in the back of the truck and came to, uh, to Edwardsville. And uh, about what time did you determine or find out that you were good at sports? Well, the second big break occurred. <laughs> I'm giving you my speech tonight. <laughs> I tell the other group some of this. I was kind of an awkward, shy kid because we moved from that boxcar with all family into this world of all these people around and, and being asked a lot of questions and being made, made fun of quite a bit. I went to see the Globetrotters play at 9 or 10 at Sportsman Park down in St. Louis. And I saw these guys out there playing. I, that's how people loved them, and the adulation around them. And I couldn't figure out how they, they were doing what they were doing. So I came back and I, I took a tennis ball and I started trying to dunk a ball. And I was only 10 years old, of course. Couldn't do it, but I got fascinated with making a ball, putting a ball through a rim. And once I found basketball and I found that basketball, my life changed. The way people thought about me, that my aspirations changed, and, and my whole outlook on what was possible in life changed around the game of basketball at age 10. You made a lifelong friend there with Governor Baum? Met Governor, uh, I went into school the next year. I was five years old or four and a half years old. I met Governor then, and uh, for some reason or another, Governor and his family became uh, my second family. I tell people that I have a scrapbook at home that I looked at before I came on this trip of about uh, 100 pages, and his mother kept a scrapbook. And she kept one for Governor and one for me. And she would just count out for a meal, count out for good words. She'd say, your tie's not straight, or get a haircut. And she was like the second family. And Governor and I grew up as almost as brothers. It's kind of amazing, you think, because two guys who spend that many years close together and go through so many things together. Well, you played high school, high school ball together? Junior high school with the schools integrated. We marched over to the new integrated schools together, played junior high school together, played high school together. Uh, we made the decision to come to the University of Illinois. We played together. We went to New York and played with the New York Tuck Tapers together. I had aspirations of being with the Knicks, and we were kind of waiting there to get called. He joined the Harlem Globetrotters, and Abe called me later and said, look, uh, I got this opportunity for you. We play the Globetrotters together. And when I bought the Globetrotters, he came down as my uh, operations guy that took care of all the alumni and all the stuff that was around that, and we've been just friends ever since. I want to go back just a little bit to, to U of I. You were the two first African-American starters. Do I have that right? That's right. And that was, what year was that? In 57, I guess, yeah. 
What was that like for for you guys to come from, you know, Edwardsville, Illinois, where it was an integrated school system, to making uh, making this huge step at a major university? Well, I get asked that question a lot too. We played for a gentleman named Joe Luco, who was legendary, and was blind to color, and blind to anything except achievement and hard work. And if you worked hard and achieved things, Luco wanted you around it. So what happened was Governor and I had become so, so known around the state of Illinois and around the country for playing basketball. People would come in from all over the United States to play against us. And at Lincoln School outdoor court and in East St. Louis and places, we played against some of the best players in the United States that come to play us. So at the time we got to the University of Illinois, this statement about being the best you could be, Luco said to hell with that. I want you to be better than anybody else you go against. <laughs> and that means you may have to be better than you think you can be. But so we just, that was just a next step for us to take and that just to play hard and conquer the world. You, you were all American there? All American, all, all Big Ten. And we started our first year. I think our first game we played, and that, this is, Jack, this is interesting. The first game we played at University of Illinois, our sophomore year, there were nearly 2,000 people that made the trip up from Edwardsville to Champaign to see the game. We played against Butler University. There were three Edwardsville high school teammates on that team started. Don Ole, Governor Vaughn, and myself. We beat Butler by about 26 points or so. It's a crazy night of party and people having a good time. I scored 26 points in that first game, and I'll never forget, everyone declared us world champions. <laughs> but uh, that was quite a night and quite a celebration for the city of Edwardsville. Wow, yeah, no doubt about that. Um, this is still the 50s, though. You're in the Midwest, and you're playing in other places like Kentucky. Yeah. And I read that uh, you, you did not have a very good experience one time in Kentucky. No, uh, I often said that the fact that Adolph Rutt could be canonized as the greatest man in sports uh, troubles me today because he made the declaration that that uh, no black would play in his facility and and no Negroes should be playing at this level and he and a couple other coaches at that time said the reason we weren't playing is because we weren't smart enough and couldn't understand the plays and all that kind of stuff. So we signed up to play at Kentucky. We couldn't play in, uh, in, uh, in Kentucky. We ended up playing in Louisville instead of Lexington and we played at the, the field house at the arena whatever the deal it is. And that experience there was strange because Governor and I would walk the streets and we couldn't eat in some of the restaurants. Our teammates went with us to a theater and we got turned away at the theater. So Governor and I walked the streets and talked about what we had to talk about. And I will tell you this, it, it was distasteful. We didn't like it, but it made us stronger. When the game started, we were, we were beating Kentucky and they were ranked number one and two in the country. And the, the crowd at that time was motivated, I believe, by Adolf. And they booed us and jeered us. And, we heard the in right word over and over again. They put security behind the uh, behind the uh, the bench. First half of that game, I think I scored 18 or 19 points. In the second half, I think I played two minutes of that second half and it was filed out. When I walked off the floor, that college band struck up Bye Bye Blackbird. And I'm thinking, I was 18 years old probably then. And I, the, the, the impact that would have on a person's psychic at that age and to be that insensitive for college students to do that and a college coach to do that uh, makes me say it's really, it was really tough to make it through that era playing basketball. But you did it though. You've always been a person from what I read of your life story who understood the principles of faith and hope yeah. and you kept going. Yeah, that's, uh, that's part of that family thing that happened down in Ilmo. Uh, you can make it. You can overcome the odds. There's something better beyond this. And this is a temporary situation you're in now. Get around this and it gets better. And the truth is, uh, every time we turn the page, uh, and by the way, I give a lot of credit to making it to governor. I have to say this. At my age now, I look back and you realize one thing. Friendships mean a lot. And when you got a friend who's both ethical and you got a friend who's smart and a friend who knows what got your back all the time, there was no doubt the two of us had each other's back. And I could not have gone through all that we went through without the two of us being together. You ended up playing together with Globetrotters. Mm -hmm. Now this was, a, this was a team that made a deep impression on you when you were much younger. <laughs> it must have been something to actually be there and be playing there. It was pretty amazing. It was pretty amazing. And the first game I played was in, uh, was in London. And I remember the, the band playing and the crowd stopping and we were lined up and, and uh, they called my name to step forward. And I was dreaming so much about being there I didn't hear him. 
And of course, I took a lot of crap from the players and the teammates at the time to move up, you know. But I remember st standing there, look at the crowd, and think about here I am in London, at Wembley, with the Harlem Globetrotters, and you know, 18,000 people just going like crazy for it. I just blanked out. What was so magical about the Globetrotters in, in those days? And we'll talk more about them now a little bit later. Yeah. On, but what was what was so special about being part of that? Well, this a, it's a long story, but people love winners. Kids love winners. Adults love winners. The media loves winners. This team knew how to win, and they knew how to win on the basketball court, and they knew how to win in rural Mississippi and, and in Chicago Stadium. They could win your heart. They had a way that nobody could turn them away. The team was so good at winning, and they beat the Lakers, the world champion Lakers, you know, twice here in Chicago Stadium that they made two feature films about that organization. So around the world, people came out to see the Harlem Globetrotters as movie stars, great athletes and movie stars. So that kind of celebrity preceded every stop that we made, but when, we, when they saw us, this doggone owner, Abe Saberstein, made sure the team never disappointed. We played at a high level, and he made sure we behaved at a, at a high level. You said a little bit before we started rolling tape that uh, when you would play in southern Illinois and back in the area where you grew up, that it was a huge deal when the Globetrotters came to town, bands would play, everything would happen. Yeah, people would turn out. In fact, that people would say things like it's like Santa Claus, like Christmas. Santa Claus comes around once a year, and we know in February or March the Globetrotters are coming back. And it, the brand is so powerful, and brands are built on, on trust, and brands are built on the promise of something happening. And most people overpromise and underdeliver, and most companies do, and most brands do. The Globetrotters had this way of making very few promises, but having this high expectation, they always seem to be able to overdeliver, whether it's winning on the court or winning off the court. And they made they made the kind of money that other teams would dream about. They had the kind of adulation and love for them that few entertainers or artists even knew about in those days. Abe Saberstein was the founder, and probably the number one promoter of all time, and he had a Great hand, great hand for quality. He knew it would take to make that team great, and he stuck by those numbers and by that requirement all the time. You played to, through 66, right? Mm -hmm. um, then you went back to school. Yeah. Went for a master's degree, was it in business and uh, marketing? Actually, I, I, when I stopped playing basketball, it occurred to me that this obsession I had with basketball had caused me to, to not pay attention to academics. And I, I knew that to be in business the way I wanted to be, I had to get really good and current academically. And we graduated easily because we worked at it. So we were there to do the graduate. So when I got back into school, I went to Wharton. I went to University of South Florida. In fact, I was an adjunct professor there. I taught after a year of being there. And I went to, uh, to Bradley for a bit. But I went back to school for the purpose of getting current and being able to compete in the corporate world. Now, at the University of Detroit, my plan was to get an MBA and then go to law school. I was working with General Motors at the time, and I got promoted, or actually recruited out of General Motors to Honeywell, and I made the decision to leave school and start on the corporate staff of Honeywell. A lot of things were happening right about that time, and you were starting to see the first African Americans uh, move into the corporate world. A friend, good friend of mine was just hired about 66 as the first black airline pilot yeah, at yeah, United yeah, in Norwood. Yeah. Uh, were the, how did, describe what it was like to be there when the doors were first starting to open. You were recruited from Yeah, it was, uh, you clearly didn't see many of your own kind there. <laughs> and, and, and some people really objected to it. And uh, uh, there's an executive order 11246, 11246, executive order passed, it said, if you, were, if you were a government contractor, you had to have a certain num demonstrate compliance with, with hiring and not be discriminating. So the corporations really wanted to show, to demonstrate this. My overall belief is this. Most people in this world and in this country are really good people and care and want to do the right thing. So in that environment that was, had been racist as an institution, inside that institution were a lot of really fine people that gave you a helping hand, that cared about what happened to you, that knew the obstacles you had to overcome. And for some reason or another, I found all those great hands extended out to help. And I tell kids this all the time, if you look hard enough, there's a helping hand reaching out for you. It's like that burning bush in the Bible. It's happening, you gotta reach for that hand and it's there to help you. And then Honeywell and 
General Motors, I found those helping hands. You held a lot of different positions at Honeywell. You were a factory manager, you worked in marketing, strategic planning. Uh, what, uh, how did you advance up the corporate ladder there? Well, the attraction to Honeywell for me was the opportunity to do a lot of different things in a lot of different industries. And when I got there, I was so fascinated by the progress that I could make <clears throat> and the learning that was taking place, I took advantage of every promotion, every experience that was available. And I seldom went any place that I didn't meet a friend or have an accomplishment in another department, another area, and I wanted to find out where I was best. And I guess you could say I wasn't any good at any damn thing because I kept trying new things, but I ended up being a general manager because I enjoyed every experience I had. I enjoyed all the people I worked with. I learned so much. Even I had battles of, of racism and discrimination. That was just another obstacle to overcome. And the reward for that was I got to be general manager. One of the things that you did along the way was to found the Executive Leadership Council for African Americans, yeah. uh, executives. Uh, you obviously understood the value of networking, of the relationships, right. of contacts. Right. How did you right. work that out or start to grow that in this culture? Yeah, I didn't start that organization. <clears throat> it was one of the first four or five. There was a, a gentleman, Al Martins, from Xerox, Barry Rand from Xerox, and Jim Kaiser from, uh, I forgot the name of companies with, but there were four or, four or five that got together and said, we've done well, we figured out the formula, and we called it a blueprint for success. Somehow or another, we got the gift of this formula for how to navigate our way through the corridors of corporate America. Let's share this with some other people. So we said, let's pull together the top 100 or top 50 blacks in corporations and be the underground that helps them understand how to work through this. We couldn't find a lot of blacks, A, that were doing well enough to qualify for that criteria, or B, that had the courage to tell their bosses that they were going someplace to meet with other black folks. But as we got more successful, the numbers grew, and we began to talk about being better in their corporations, learning how to network, learning how to study, learning how to advance. Here's the mistakes we made. Then what happened was, we began to get more and more people in because this small group was going back telling others about how helpful it was. We invited CEOs in to come listen to our discussion so they wouldn't be threatened by it. That helped. <clears throat> what we found out though is that we still hadn't, hadn't broken the, the barrier to being leaders, to be general managers and leaders and being on boards of directors. And the big barrier was we still didn't own our own companies. So we spent some time talking about those three things. How did you... Uh how did you grow it to where it is today? How did you make, uh, as you say, there were some things that weren't happening. You weren't, you weren't uh, running your own companies. You weren't in those highly visible positions. Yeah. How did you keep advancing the cause? I think we, 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 we continue to teach and show by example. And we had the seminars that allowed us to, to share our experience. Because when you're in a corporation, as an African American, you're the only one there, and you're pretty insulated. And this gave the African American uh, professional, a chance to be around other African American professionals, and they talked about the mistakes they had made, successes they had had, and that helped to give everyone confidence when they went back. There's somebody who's been through this before. As importantly, though, when I wanted to sell a contract to Xerox, and it was a big contract, I'd go on the phone and call Al Martins. I say, Al, tell me who the decision makers are really inside of Xerox who would help me, and he'd pinpoint, try here or go there. It would take the normal salesperson or vice president weeks or months to know how that would work out. Now, the flip side of that is when they came into Honeywell, I gave the same kind of help. But we learned to network in a way that benefited the individuals, and frankly, in the long haul, it benefited the corporations. So eventually, the companies would realize this is a good thing for it us. It's a good thing. It's He's a good got thing. an end. It's a good thing. It was a good thing. It was absolutely nothing but a good thing. Retention was higher. The attitude of the executive, black executive, was better. Their progression through the corporations are better, and their aspirations tend to get in line with the company and growing as professionals. How about reaching back down toward the uh, colleges, the business schools, to, to recruit the best people, the best young people? Well, part of, part of the, the lesson learned there was models put forth by, by uh, companies like Xerox and companies like uh, Corning, they were part of it, and American Express and others was that the real feeder system is what counts. Finding the right students and profiling the students in the right way. So we became pretty good at helping departments figure out 
would be the best bet. Again, it is a business. It wasn't a social organization, so we got that really clear. These companies are in business to make money. They must have the best. These are the Boston Celtics. They're not an amateur team trying to make it, and it's not giving gifts out. So you help them recruit the best talent you can find. And that helped a lot to start out who was real and who wasn't coming into the ranks. When did you retire from Honeywell? I left Honeywell uh, in 1992, 93. Okay. And I left because uh, while I intended to, to run the Globetrotters and still continue with Honeywell, the team got too big and too popular and too, too much felicity around and I, I respectfully had to, had to resign, had to retire. The Globetrotters had fallen, the, the golden brand had fallen on some really hard times by then. Yeah, in fact, uh, Jack, what happened was I'd been doing acquisitions and mergers for Honeywell. I'd built a couple of ventures, and so I, I met a lot of banking people who were doing workout work for, for companies that had gone under. And I got this call one day from a friend who was in the banking business said, look, take a look at some. They got their Harlem Globetrotters here. They're, they're in, going to the bankruptcy. And I said, I don't have any interest in being involved in basketball in this way. I at one time wanted an NBA team, but I, I took a look at the property, and I knew something about branding back in those days. I think it was Kidder Peabody or somebody had the team on, on the market for $44 million. Zero assets, no inventory, nothing. Just the name Harlem Globetrotters. And I said, well, if nobody buys this thing, it'd be a shame to see that great institution go, disappear completely. So I sat down with my then chairman, Mike Bunn, senior, seniority of Honeywell, who I worked for. I said, look, I'm busy, but I can take on a social cause. I'd like to be able to restore the Harlem Globetrotters to a level where People can remember it. I'll do a book. I'll try to get a movie done. I'll probably open uh, some retail so people can buy the, the you know, souvenirs about the Globetrotters, mainly to tell the story of how great this institution was at one time. And he said, that sounds like a good, not a bad problem. How much time do you need? I said, probably no time at all, Mike. I'm busy with other projects. Well, every day I turned another page. More opportunities and more good things seemed to be happening with it. And I realized how strong that brand was and how needed it was around the world. And I just slipped into full-time working with them. How did you turn the Globetrotters around? The way you do most companies, it's not, never any one thing. It's a thousand different pieces you got to get lined up and do it right and do it hard and do it, you know, on schedule the first day. But the thing we focused on was understanding what was our purpose. Why did it matter in 1955 and 1945 and 1965 and for some reason it doesn't matter today? What made it work? So I spent a lot of time going back historically and sorting through the mess. You know, people have different opinions and I figured out what made it matter. And I said, we're gonna build around those three, three points and we'll try to restore the confidence that the marketplace once had in us. What are the three, what, what are the three legs this is built on? I, I go to sleep thinking of this all the time even now that I'm not around it as much. Number one, it was a championship basketball team. There was no team in the world that was better. And these guys wore that honor, that badge with pride because of segregation. The collection of black ball players on that team through the mid-60s were the best basketball players in the world, bar none. And I said, that championship basketball legacy has to be restored. And the confidence that goes into it has to be there. The next thing was that uh, people always felt the Globetrotters were a friendly place to go, to visit. And families could be felt comfortable trusting their kids with the Globetrotters. Uh, whether you're raising money for, for the boys clubs or the YMCA's or helping a hospital out, the Globetrotters could always be counted on to be there as a team with a heart. And they didn't do it because it was scripted to do it. They taught away in the small towns, the back roads, and the players did because it's part of their life. So those two pieces, and the final one was the Globetrotters played great basketball. They were good to get along with. And the final one is that they just simply knew they had to entertain kids. We never lost that entertainment piece. How do you, how do you, uh, how does the, how do the Globetrotters stand apart now in a, in a culture and society that is so wrapped up with uh, you know, the star athletes, the star teams, and how, how do you convey that basic goodness, you know, in this kind of, because some of our athletes, you know, they have a lot of problems. They don't, they don't think so much of, yeah the example they're setting. Yeah. Well, my fundamental belief is that uh, if you lower the bar, someone will descend down to it. <laughs> the flip side of that, when you raise the bar, it's amazing 
how many great people and great kids are out there who will rise to that level and they inspire others to do it. And I think uh, when we lower the bar in sports or entertainment or in business, uh, it doesn't help anybody in society out. And so the first thing we talked about with the Globetrotters, how high can we raise the bar in this first pass? And how many can reach that point and get over the top of it? We were surprised at how accommodating it was to keep raising. We kept raising the bar. Behavior had to be better, attitudes had to be better, performance had to be better, and we kept raising the bar every year. And what are the measures of success that you can show now from taking them from bankruptcy to where they are today? Well, the team is back to being a household, a household name again. The team is respected in buildings and, you know, arenas around the world again. The team is financially stable. It's solid. It's rock solid. I think the players walk around with pride to say they're a former Harlem Globetrotter. Back in the late 80s and early 90s, if you had asked me questions about the Globetrotters, I'd say, look, sir, let's move on to another subject. Uh, that's not something I want to talk about. I think me and myself, along with several others, would be proud to have interviews and talk about that grand old institution and what it means and what it's going to do going forward. Plus, it's making money. You know. Yeah, it's financially successful. Financially solid. We gave, in, in my time there, I think I averaged $2 million a year, roughly $25, $30 million I gave the charity over the time, and, and not to mention the contribution to time, but we made a point. Part of our P&L was designated to give money back to the communities we were, we were serving. What areas or what, what organizations, what, what charities, what activities, uh, you could pick out a, a zillion of them, mm -hmm. but what, what are the ones that you would target with, you know, this kind of a strategic philanthropy thing? If I were doing it today, uh, as I think about the Globetrotters today, I think there are areas in crisis, like in Haiti, mm -hmm. and there'll be this rush to put money in in the short term, but I think with the Globetrotters, they're able to be there face-to-face -face and sustain contributions and inspiration. Uh, we spent a lot of time in South Africa. Uh, when the flooding happened in, uh, in New Orleans, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, raising money for that, encouraging other people to do things for it. I think always the standard bearer, education and health. Uh, my attitude is that uh, the underpinning of our society is education, and the underpinning of education is health. And you got to do those things before a kid is eight, nine years old. They have bad health habits and aren't starting to get educated by that time. It's a tough struggle. So every contribution that we could make or I would make to, to health and to underpinning education, I would pour money and time into. You also spent some time uh, as chairman of the National Basketball Hall of Fame. Um, tell me about uh, your activities there. Well, that's when I, when I, they say hit my home run in life. Financially, I made a decision that, uh, with my wife and family that <coughs> we would share our good fortune with uh, those things that worked for us. And basketball is one of the things that really worked. So I figured through the Hall of Fame. Excuse me. Take a drink and we'll start that over. Sorry to break like this. It's all right. No problem. Not a problem at all. Okay. I'll go back to the beginning of that. Yeah. We'll ask the question again. Um, so, what, <coughs> what led you to uh, move to the, uh, move to the uh, uh, National Basketball Hall of Fame? I think his microphone is under the Oh, oh, yep. Yeah, Got it. Right. Okay. We'll get it. There we go. Okay, thank you. I have a tendency to step on mine and pull them right off. <laughs> um, as you were saying, uh, you were at a position where you could do something different and uh, you had probably a lot of different opportunities. Why did this one stand out as something that you wanted to do? Yeah. My family, we talked about the things that have been important in my life. <coughs> Excuse me, actually basketball had been one of the driving forces and it meant so much to me and people around me. And I looked at the Hall of Fame as being not just a, a museum, but an aspirational institution. It's something that if you were a kid in St. Louis, Missouri, or in East St. Louis, you can aspire to that recognition of the Hall of Fame. So I thought as an aspirational organization or institution, that'd be worth investing in and, and keeping it viable and convincing those who made it to the Hall of Fame to look back into the communities. And so at first I donated a side amount of my time and then some money, and then I was fortunate enough to be selected to be chairman of the organization.
there's an award there now that uh, bears your name. Uh, tell me what, about the criteria. Who, who gets selected? Uh, what, it's not just about being successful. It's about what you do. Yeah, you your contributions, how you give back. And it's a balance of being a great athlete and also being a great citizen. And I have to tell you, the board of directors, my, my, my deciding committee, I can't give you all the names because some don't want their name mentioned because it's supposed to be a hidden committee, but there are two or three members of that committee that are unbelievable. And I'll tell you one name that will shock you, that I'm shocked at how brilliant this man is and how hard he works at it, Bill Cosby. He's on that screening committee. And I say this because I have to give Bill credit for, for first of all, being on the committee and being there active every, every time he's there. And, and uh, when he gets on the calls or in the meetings, He's got this way of looking at life. He says, Manny, committing, I got all CEOs and Hall, Hall of Famers and the highest end of our of the society working on that, on that committee, and they all do it voluntarily. But Bill holds courts for a minute. He says, Manny, there are people on the top that are being paid to be good people. There are people taught away on the streets that do it because it's just the right thing to do. There are people who are famous because we made them famous in the media. There are people taught away that nobody knows about. This award should recognize both ends. And I mean, it just changed, turned us upside down how we thought about recognizing people who use basketball and sports to do good things for their communities. And so we've been just having a ball with it. It's one of the top awards ever given out of the Basketball Hall of Fame now. How long has it been in place? This is probably the fourth year. And our, uh, our award list looks like who's who in sports. But if you take that award to Philadelphia or to New, in New Jersey or the Southern California, our uh, Atlanta, it also looks like who's who because their folks have been recipients of, of awards there. So it's a national kind of thing. It's a national Absolutely. recognition, yeah. yeah. I will go international with it too at some point. Right. What, uh, what are you up to these days? Well, my, my, my big hope is that I can put a, uh, a math and science uh, academy in Edwardsville, my hometown. I tried to donate a lot of money back to education back in that area. But I'd like to have a one place, here's my story. I came through Edwardsville High School, and I think the first course I took in biology, I didn't do very well, but I had a good teacher. But I didn't do well. It just didn't feel right to me for some reason. So I always had this feeling, I wasn't supposed to be good in math and science. I never took another science course. When I got to the University of Illinois, I took these academic, these screening tests you take, I had an extremely high aptitude in science which I said, how can that be? I never took the course, never thought about it very much. So my, my view is there are students coming along, they get pushed back in math or pushed back in science because maybe something didn't happen right, but they have this aptitude to do it right. I want to find the kids, I ended up being in the National Science Fund a lot of way. The federal government gave me a National Science Fellowship Scholarship because of the test I took in, in science. I said, I want to find these kids that can be inspired by science and math that have the kind of talent you have in basketball or something people find out about because they work at it. And I want to give them an opportunity to, to go to the gym floor one day and play basketball and get their skills honed, but go in the classroom the next day and find out how good they are at math and science. So my vision is to have a math and science academy that's built around finding the underachievers, black, white, whatever, male, female. They can come in and we can make a determination where their aptitude is in those two areas and, and nourish it and coach it and build it because it was math and science, actually science, that convinced me that I could be an achiever in business and achiever in life. Would this be kind of a residential setting? My vision would say that people might come in from all over the country to be in resident there. But the starting would be in, uh, start would be in Edwardsville for students in that area that could be driven in day to day. And I think the mayor's behind it. I'm sure that the superintendent of schools there uh, at Hightower is supporting part of it. Lewis and Clark College is behind it. I haven't talked to folks at SIU yet, but once we get the building in place and they see the dream start to unfold, I think it'll be a great place to, uh, to have the nurturing of academic success. Well, Ed, Ed Hightower might have something to say with SIU, yeah. Ed Hightower is one of the greatest. Yeah. I, I don't know that, I don't know how many people hear this show, but what an asset we have in, uh, in Ed Hightower. Probably you rank all the superintendents of schools around the United States and I've been in most school districts in this country. He's in the top 1%. And there's no question why that region is flourishing. People are happy there. Uh, population is growing. Housing market looks good. Racial conditions are solid. People feel good about being a part of it. 
the academic institutions are solid. When the kids are happy and the academics are good, the right things seem to happen. Kind of come to the close of my questions. Mm -hmm. um, as you look back on a, a very long and successful life, what are the things that give you the most satisfaction personally? Well, <laughs> I, just, I just told a fellow down in the meeting we just had it, two things I'm, I'm proudest of. One, uh, my roots. That trek from Elmo to Edwardsville. I just, it's like a dream. Elmo to Edwardsville, that boxcar to that town of Edwardsville and be embraced by those people and have a chance to get through a great school, have a chance to play sports, meet a guy like Joe Luco, have a relationship with people like the mayor of that town. Uh, amazing. Secondly would be, obviously, uh, going to the University of Illinois because it opened up the whole state. And the third is uh, to have a family like I have. I have two daughters that are unbelievable. <laughs> My dad is unbelievable. My extended family around, uh, it's just unbelievable. And uh, great wife, 35 years. Three things I'm proudest of. Many blessings. Thank you. Many blessings. Thank you. Um, one final question. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what was your reaction to being uh, nominated as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy? I used to tell the players something, that uh, when, you're, when you're walking along the ground at sea level and there's a fence six foot tall, you can't see over that fence. You have to get to 10,000 feet or 5,000 feet or at least two stories to know what's on the other side of it. It just convinced me how little I know about the possibilities in life. Because being selected is not something I ever dreamed that the path I was on, I'd have an opportunity to be selected as a, as a laureate. And then upon being selected, I look at it and say, this is way outside of my comfort zone or what I could see or thought was possible. And so it's an honor. My family's honored. My daughters are here. They're honored. And it just feels good to think that somebody who's not, I'm not a celebrity has appreciated uh, the work and the time and the achievements uh, of a career. Very good. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.